guys, Joe Fry here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. I am going to continue with the mini mill by finishing up the base. Now, if you're following along, if you're building this kit, uh, you have probably found out or will find out that some of the features on this base are relatively easy because there's no dimensions on them. It says center, center. Uh, there's a height dimension from the back, the back of this boss to the back of the upper pulley mount. And then the center to center. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger because I'm going to put nylon washers on either side of the pulley on top so there's no end abrasion aluminum on aluminum up there. So that'll come out to be 20 per side, so 270. And that'll reduce this down to 330 because there'll be a little bit more taken off of this side. So that 350 is going to stay where it is. Nothing fancy on the top. A couple of screw holes in here for a side mount tray. There's going to be a couple of screw holes in this side as well. Now the screw holes that go on the back side, they're shown right here on the print. The screws may protrude through into the void that I've put in this and push the shelf out of the way. That being said, I may move the centers of this a little bit tighter, make these through holes and put the thread in the shelf insert so that when I put the shelf on the side, and tighten down the screws the screws pull the new shelf unit into here and secure it i think that's not a bad way to go i'll know that's uh, the way i'm going to go when i get there dimension to pay attention to on the front the elevation screw for the table is a given distance from the dovetail feature itself and pretty much everything else is wide open i'm going to set this in the machine initially this way against the stationary jaw couple of stops on either side and I'm going to tram the stops to establish the center line so that everything is true to the base and that's when I'm going to find out if the part was cocked when I milled the bottom or not so if the center of the boss doesn't end up in the center of the boss I may have to cheat that center line and we'll find that out when we get over to the mill let's do it That is my x-axis center line. And I think this will make sense in a second. The dimension I'll be shooting for is the 375 from the back of this guy right here to these two faces. And I'll drill and tap holes in those faces. And this side, I believe, will be complete. I'm going to leave the quill locked and I'm going to lower the table, the required dimension to clean this face right here, 375. All right, 375 does not clean that face, so I'm going to clean this face zero and then go down to the 375. Let's see what we get there. Thank you. 
Okay, there's not a whole lot of boss left right there, but I'm hoping that doesn't cause a problem. I'm going to put the drill check in, grab some pins, and I'm going to visually line these up along the y-axis because the X should have been established back here with the stops. Using a pin of a very similar diameter, come down on the boss and use an eye loop to look around and see how close it actually is. That's pretty tight right there. Set my Y axis digital to zero right now. Move up, find the center of the other one, record the value, start drilling. All right, simple features, let's move on. Next feature I'm gonna do is the thickness of this particular cylindrical protrusion here and the distance in between these guys. Uh, I would like to see this come out symmetrical to the support rib, but I don't know if that's gonna be possible. So I'm just gonna to touch up on the surfaces and figure out what's going on. I'm going to use a cutter with a generous radius on the end. It looks like a chamfer, but it's an actual radius. So as I get down into this surface here, I don't want to leave a step with a sharper cutter. So I'm going to try to position the cutter, the radius on the cutter to hit the radius in this corner right here so it looks like the surface was intended to be that way. I'm just going to dust them all off and see what I get. We'll go from there. Okay, with the surfaces finished, I can take a visual representation of what I have. Sorry for the shake there. That's the boom moving. It's very long. With those surfaces complete, and I know there's a part radius here, but I have the cutter set for this height back here and not the front. I'm going to take a visual on that, take a dimensional on that, and I will know exactly which way to go. I recorded the values. This is zero. This is a plus 550, and this is a 1630. For what it's worth, it's a 5 8 cutter. Be right back. By using an adjustable parallel cinched up in the gap, it's then really easy to figure out what the dimension is. Adjustable parallels are very handy to have if you don't have them. Find a cheap set. Even a cheap set will do you, but make sure you inspect them before you start using them to know that they are truly parallel. After gathering up all the numbers, I need about an eight thousandths cut off of here, and then a symmetrical removal on either side of this should bring everything in nice and smooth. So that's next.
I'm going to go back inside the gap right here. Everything is dimensionally correct. The symmetry, I like the symmetry. I'm going to remove 20 thou off of this surface right here to allow for the nylon washer that I will put in there and maybe a couple off the back. The next setup in line is pretty straightforward. The casting is located against the stationary jaw, trapped in between the two stops. I'm using a pin to locate on this diameter right here. And if you feel better about it, use an indicator to check this at 90, 0, and 90 on the other side to assure concentricity. This is a 250 hole in the front, 125 in the back, about an inch and a half down. So I've got an aluminum spacer block in here that I'm going to drill and ream through this, through that, through the bottom, and then I'm going to finish the top. Got a piece of Celcon in here nesting against the casting so the aluminum on aluminum doesn't scar the casting. The setup will also be used to establish the front face, the thickness of this boss, which is not called out, but you can't mill this face down without getting close to it. So I'll map my digital coordinates so I don't knock this island off, and then I can put the dovetails on, and the front should be done. After taking a good hard look at the assembly print and some of the sizes of the components and changes that I have planned, I'm making a last minute change here and I'm going to go to a 157 on this instead of the 125. 157. Now we finish the top to 250, call that feature done. To give myself a visual reference of contact with the cutter that I'm going to be using, I'm going to put a single line along the face of this. I'm going to put a line across the side of it. That'll let me know when the surface is clean. I'm going to give myself a contact witness surface here. One on the left side, one on the right side, and the rear doesn't matter. I don't want to take too much off the sides here because then you lose the round reference on the top and it starts looking funny. I'm working with the same center line zero that I worked with to do the spindle, and hopefully the contact points on either side of this are symmetrical when I look at the digital readout. That'll let me know that this lug is in line with the spindle. It really doesn't matter because the table is adjustable left and right. So if you have to be a little bit off-center, no harm, no foul. Let's do it. Additionally, for those of you that are wondering, there is no dimensional reference between this plane and this plane right here. I would think that it's a better idea to have this a little proud from this surface so that there's no interference when you try to get the, the knee off. Because you certainly can't put it on from the bottom. So try not to go subsurface with this or the knee may bump into this as you try to install it. Okay, a couple of thoughts here before we move on. Although this particular lug does not have to be central to the dovetail, the hole that goes through that lug does have to be central to the dovetail so it lines up with the feature in the knee. Step number one. I would like to see this symmetrical to the outer sides. Yes, I would. But if it doesn't happen, it's not a showstopper. This surface here, too, should be a little bit higher than the front of this spindle here. So make a note of that. If it's lower and the dovetail feature is lower, you're going to have a very difficult time putting the knee on. So that's trick number two. Uh, the red lines are so that I can figure out where I am cleaned up at. If for some reason this has changed since it started and the red on the boss is just going to be for contact and I will look at the digital to determine how centered this is to where I want to be trapped between the blocks with the digital X axis at zero the spindle hole should be on center so it would be nice to see it clean up 
with a symmetrical reading on the digital readout. If that doesn't happen, yeah, it's not a showstopper, but I would like to keep this true to this. Let's find out. On the top of my vise is nice and clean, cleaned with alcohol, and I am going to write the digital readout readings right on here with red Sharpie marker so that I don't have to worry about blowing papers off the table as I progress. Put that right there. All right, here we go. Having made contact with each side of the lug, I can determine exactly how far off center I am or determine whether or not I want to use this as the center. This does not have to be true to the spindle bore because the table moves back and forth. So this has no relationship to the spindle bore, none whatsoever. Uh, I will track the outside of the dovetail at this point to see if the shift is warranted or what. This is one of those moments where the exploration will pay off in the final end. So let's just uh, take a minute here to figure it out. After making contact with the boss and making contact with the sides on both sides of this part, I recorded all the numbers on my vise. Let me show you how I'm going to make the calculations to put everything where it needs to be. The line in the middle of this particular graphic here represents the zero on the digital readout where the machine was positioned to do the spindle. Making contact with the left side of the boss, the recorded number was 298.5, 298.5 on the left side. On the right side, it's 287. That's a difference of 11.5 thousandths. Split the difference, 5 and 3 quarter thousandths, 5 thousand 7 tenths shift in that direction would put this feature right directly on center. Same thing with the sides, the small witness mark on the side. 704 and 5 tenths on the left side, 690 and 5 tenths on the right side. That's a difference of 14 thousandths. So that makes a difference of 7 per side. So if this is 5 and 3 quarters moving over, this is still going to be shy of where it needs to be by 1 thousandth and 2 tenths. I mean, we're talking a model here, guys. A thousand 2 tenths isn't half bad. But if you look at the difference between these two, if I were to take this one to like six and a quarter over there, it's a half a thou over and this would be a half a thou under. So the shift I'm going to make on my x-axis is going to be in that direction. Six. Let's say six. Now my digital reads out in half thou increments, so six and a half is going to be good. Six and a half, I'll re-zero it. I will make all my cuts symmetrical about center and just dust the outsides here on the boss in the back of the part. So I hope you follow that. Eleven and a half difference between the two numbers. Five and three quarters splits it. Fourteen different between the two numbers. Fourteen divided by two, which is half. Seven splits it. So a six and a half shift makes this one a little bit over, makes this one a little bit under. Still going to be within a thousandth of perfect. All right, let's cut it. And just so nobody's completely confused as to what's going on, I am going to take the part and move the part this way, six thou, six and a half thou, and re zero the digital readout. Okay, so the cutter is going to move that way, part's going to move this way. This number will get bigger from center, this number will get smaller. Okay, part's moving to the right to zero, cutter's moving to the left, right there. Okay, bear in mind over a dovetail, the theoretical sharp corners of a male featured dovetail are not sharp. They should be rounds or they should be small flats. The chances of the female or the cutter that made the female feature that goes on here having a dead sharp 
point on the cutter is pretty slim. So the small radius or the flat allows for mating of the two features to go together and allowance for the radius that's on the female slide feature that will go on here. So since it's going to be a very small corner, the final sizing across here will be 10 thousandths less per side. So it's called out as an 875. I'm going to make it 855. But that 855 feature is going to be very superficial because the rest is going to be removed with an angle cut. I'll establish the DRO readings with a full surface cut, and then I'll raise the cutter to just cut the edge, maybe about halfway through. That'll make it easier for the area in the back here. All right, for anybody interested, that is a 312 cutter. That is about an 8 millimeter diameter cutter. I took a nice clean pass up one side, down the other side, so that the mating surface of the knee that goes on here is going across a nice, smooth, continuous surface. If you were to mill it this way, you may have a problem with the uh, engagement of the mating part. I will also polish this up and clean it up real nice. Everything did come out nice and symmetrical. You can see the step cut that I put in there for the dovetail feature. I don't know how much deeper the dovetail feature is going to go. I know it does go 125 deep, but how much of this edge is going to be left and whether or not it's on the final model. Well, that's up in the air right now. We don't know. So it would be nice to see a little extra meat right here where the dovetail feature comes around and mates. But I do not want this hanging outside of the knee part that goes on there. All right, let's put a dovetail cutter in there and make the feature and uh, call it a day. <laughs> no, I just call it a day, call it finished. Be right back. The height of my dovetail cutter is being set with a field gauge to be five thousandths above this surface. The dial on my knee is set to minus five from the zero on the dial. So when the dial hits zero, I know this should be on the surface here. I will not turn this on and get a witness mark here. I want this to be cosmetically pure. And it is at this point that you need to decide which surface, which two surfaces you're going to use to mate your dovetail. If you're going to use the top and the edge, well, it really doesn't matter how deep you go with this. If you're going to use the chamfered edge and this face back here, well, then you better stay a thou or so away because trying to get three mating surfaces on a dovetail is just this side of impossible. And usually you only need two anyway. So I'm going to start off with about a 120 deep cut here and see what I come up with. And I'll make that call just before I make the final cuts. And I may also explain what I just said on paper in a minute, so stick around. Here we go. This particular surface here is only five thousandths away from being finished, and there is a considerable amount of material there. It's going to be a real roll of the dice to determine which side I want to have making contact. On a standard knee mill, it's the back side and the underside of the V. The front is usually open and relieved in the middle a little bit, so you very rarely see wear marks here. It'll be the wear marks will appear down here. I'm going to try to shoot for that because I kind of like the way that looks much better. And when this is undercut, there's going to be a substantial land right there. So let's continue with this cut and uh, just head in that direction. Okay, now the dovetail right now is about five thousandths out in every dimension. And this is decision time where you're going to bank the knee from. Let's take a look at the knee for a second. If the bottom of the knee were flat, it would be okay to bank on the bottom and the inside here and leave the top clear. But obviously with the 
protrusions on this side for the knee screws, they are forcing you to bank on the angle and the inside face. So the depth of the feature that I'm cutting right now has to go deeper to allow for it to clear back here. And the sides do have to be shaved down somewhat to allow for these protrusions. That is a shame. I wish it was something a little different than that, but that's uh, the reality of this situation. So I'll cut that dovetail at 126, 127 deep, and I will fit this. And that's just the way it's got to be. <laughs> that's a shame. I wish it was more like a real knee mill, but I guess that's the way it was back in the 1800s. Okay, so be it. Now, unfortunately, on the far side, this particular shelf here is not going to work out because of the adjustment screws for the Gibbs. So instead of just cutting it off and leaving a square corner there, uh, because of the taper in the base, it is going to dig in further downstream. I'm going to take a small chamfer cutter, and I'm going to chamfer this off, and the chamfer will just get a little bit bigger as it gets to the end due to the way the casting is built. Unfortunately, that's got to go. Too bad. Then we'll test fit it. Let's do it. Okay, after taking a real close look at what we're dealing with here, one side of the knee, or one side of the base casting can be a straight-up dovetail. But the other side, you can see this side here, has more of a square profile where the set screws are. That looks like a square edge, and that looks like a 60-degree point. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a form tool in there, and I'm going to take one side, and I'm going to make a square corner out of it. Not up here, of course, down here where these screws clear. And I'm going to leave the other side alone. The tool I'm going to be using for this is a hand-ground 3 8 diameter drill blank. It's about a 10 millimeter drill blank. A threading tool would probably be fine as well if it was, a, well, yeah, a right-hand threading tool would be fine as well. This tip of this tool has to be almost perfectly in that groove right there because I'm going to knock this corner off to be 90 degrees or a facsimile thereof. So let's find out what happens, right? Here we go. Okay, after some tool tweaking and a little bit of cleanup work, let's try the knee that goes on there, and you'll see very clearly how this 90-degree feature over here works. Now, that could have been done. You don't need a form tool for that. You could have moved the entire base uh, 30 degrees vertical, counterclockwise rotation in this view, and just done that with a square corner end mill. That would have been just fine. Hey guys, all the machining is complete, and as it sits, I cleaned the cutter marks off the top of this particular part, off of this surface, because that's a highly visible surface, and it's fairly well deburred. Uh, there are two issues that I am aware of right now with this part, and one of them is going to take a little bit more work and thought, well, actually, they probably both will. This particular protrusion right here is a very insignificant feature but wait till you see what happens. Let's test fit this guy for you. I'll show you that. This is the gib material. And we'll stick that in there. Actually, it's not going to be full length, but boy, that's like it's on a servo that is very smooth and I'm very pleased with that result squaring off this bottom corner worked out really well if you're building this kit and you don't knock those nubs off you're gonna to have to do that so keep that in mind okay now the big reveal watch this go grab a tissue because you're gonna cry when you see this Zoom 
pin for this one. That pin is an absolutely zero play on that. Watch where it hits that boss. If I were to drill and tap that per print, I would probably break out on the top. And just from a visual standpoint, I got to tell you that I can't stand the way that looks. That's got to be, got to be better than that. Sorry about the boom here. Got to be better. So what I plan to do is I'm going to cut that off and I am going to fake it. I'm going to make another one. I'm going to put it in that place. I don't know if I'm going to screw it in from the inside of the door cabinet or make a wing on either side and screw it down from the outside. Either way, I think it'll look fine. If I want to hide it, you'd never know that that happened. That's a fact. But that's just, that's a heartbreaker right there. That pin is just tangent to the top. And it should drop down about 70 thousandths, maybe 80 thou, two millimeters, millimeter and a half. If that happens, this surface would have to drop down. The dovetail would have to drop down. This would drop down. And I'm telling you, I think it would be a real problem. I don't know if it's my casting or all the castings in general, but that one got me. Big time. That should be a starting datum point right there. The center of that little boss. Believe it or not, as stupid as a feature that is, that should be a, a starting datum point, the center of that, for everything up here. There is a dimension from here to the center of that, but where do you start from? Do you start from here and go to the center, or do you start from the center and go to here? Two totally different end results, and you can see what the result is the way I did it. So, yep, got caught on that one. Not a showstopper. When I'm done, you won't even see it. And the other one is the opposite side of this boss right here. The hole is slightly off-center, and it appears to be even more off-center than it actually is because the casting is grossly rounded on one corner and cleaned up on the other corner. So the fact that there's less material on one side gives the illusion of it being extremely off-center. I'm not going to take this out of here right now because I'm going to set up and I'm going to knock that pocket out in the back, but I'm going to sleep on it first, figure out exactly which way I want to go so it looks as good as it can possibly look. Thank you very much for tuning in. We're going to call this one a wrap because I've had just about enough disappointment for one day. Actually, I'm lying. It's, I'm very pleased with what I got. This is a little disappointing, but I won't lose any sleep over it. Thank you very much for tuning in, guys. As always, very much appreciate it. Wherever you are in the world, hope you're well, happy, and safe. All of the above. I'm Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. Come on, you...